Good morning. Um, I'm excited to be able to share one of the Psalms today, this being Holy Week. I thought it was appropriate to, to look into Psalm 22. It's the Psalm that I believe Jesus references with one of the sayings as he hung on the cross on Friday, where he's, he cries out, My God, my God, why haven't you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And um, it's a very powerful psalm. Um, it's a psalm of David. It was a psalm of lament. It was a psalm meant uh, really where many Jews, not just Jesus at this time, really leaned into that psalm during times of trouble. And I want to look at that here in a minute. Um, many would understand that's where that came from. And so I thought it's worth uh, just looking at this psalm and, um, and also asking ourselves some questions regarding the way we frame our theology around it. Um, in my training and looking at scriptures, uh, I would look at this time on, with Jesus on the cross where he, he uttered these phrase, this phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And based on a few passages in the Old Testament, would frame it to say that God had turned his back on him because Jesus had taken all the sins of the world on him and therefore God couldn't look at him based on a passage over in Isaiah 59. Psalm 22 means everything. If we just stopped at that first verse, we may come to the conclusion that there was um, God turning his back on, on Jesus and Jesus not knowing where he was. But for a Jew in that time, uh, the Psalms of Lament, which comprised almost 30% of the Psalms that we read were Psalms that God allowed his people to express anger, disappointment, doubt, as they work through very troubling times of their own. And so Psalm 22 was one of these. It fires me up to understand that God was allowing this, um, this expression. <laughs> I think that uh, freedom of expression was very powerful. I know that when a commanding officer gives a subordinate uh, the ability to say something without hindrance, uh, it, it, it gets to the truth of what that individual was really feeling. I know for our own boys to allow them, and you with children, to allow them to express what they're really feeling. If we put, if we, I know is if we put a hold on that, we're not gonna get at the root of what's really going on. And it, it is important to hear, even though it might be tough at a certain point. And I think, think God uh, allows that. And it actually, he allowed his, the, the psalmist to really process. And you'll see in Psalm 22, as you read this processing of emotion. And it begins in, uh, my God, my God, Verse 1, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far off from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And he, <clears throat> it's very obvious. The psalmist really starts with this lament, with honesty in his emotions, and he's processing verbally. <clears throat> are you a verbal processor? <laughs> Many of us are. And uh, maybe the psalmist was. Maybe that's what God is allowing. And verse 2, my God, I cry out day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Um, I found that, I found time of distance and frustration and being able to express that to God. And I think all of us have been in that space. Um, and yet I, I trust and feel like looking at these Psalms gives me faith that he allows me to enter that space. But you see a shift here in verse three. And um, he says, yet, the word yet. <laughs> Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. And he goes in to talk about a remembrance. And, and remembrance for, for him, but he's also directing it towards God, if you read this. And you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. It's almost like saying, God, um, remember. Uh, I want you to remember these things. And then he even gets personal. He says, you brought me out, verse 9, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you in my mother's womb. You have been my God. So there's a, there's a push here. He says, and then in verse 11, do not 
do not be far from me, as trouble is near and there is no one to help. And then he starts to describe from verse 12 on the desperation that he's in. And so when you read this and, and as we as we pray to God through these Psalms, you know, you may have a point where it's just overwhelmed with just troubling things. I mean, this past week, um, Thursday, my, my, we, I had to make the decision to call a vet to come put my dog down on Friday. Um, actually, she's in the picture right there, the one with the growling teeth. <laughs> Both of them are, but the brown one. Uh, nutmeg, she's sweet as can be, awesome dog. Um, I, I cried, I cried so much and I just, it, it was, it was so emotional. And then, so that happened Friday, Saturday, I get a call from my sister. My wife and I were camping up in the mountains and my dad had fallen for the fourth time. He's, um, he's 86 years old, he'd fallen. And now we're negotiating, um, just dementia and Parkinson's, a number of things. You could be praying for him. His name is John, but, um, it's challenging. And so, uh, uh, we have to figure out money situations, how to keep him safe, and all these things. And you're like, I, I feel, I feel just overwhelmed with stuff. <laughs> and so you, we we get to those places, um, and God wants us to describe them. And then, um, but you see a shift here that's really really cool. And but in verse 19, it's the first time this psalmist makes a request. He says he requests from God, but you, Lord. He says, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Uh, rescue me from the mouth of lions. Verse 22, again, you see a shift from this lament and then the request to praise. He says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Look at verse 24. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry from help for help. So he hadn't he hadn't turned his back on him. He has listened. He has understood. And um, what I hadn't really described is what's really very interesting. As you go, look back at at verse fourteen, from fourteen to eighteen. He is messianic prophecy regarding it basically spells out everything that happened on the cross to Jesus. Poured out like water, bones out of joint, heart has turned to wax, mouth dried up to a pot like a potsherd, dogs surround me, my, they pierce my hands and my feet, my bones are in display, people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cat. I mean, it's amazing how um, specific. Um, one of the things that helped me in my faith is understanding some of the statistics behind, that's a hard word to say, um, the statistics behind uh, probability theory and everything else. But to have even seven of the prophecies uh, be fulfilled is, um, it's almost infinitesimal that um, it can actually occur within one individual. Um, they said that it's like taking the state of Texas, covering it with silver dollars, uh, yay big. Uh, coloring one of them and having someone blindfolded to go in and have one shot at picking that out would be like um, seven of these coming true in one person. <laughs> so we need to pay attention to that. So we see the psalmist moving uh, through the emotions and it's, it's really amazing. And so when Jesus hung on a cross, and cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's don't be, let's don't be quick to put a theology um, around that, that talks about a God that may not be that way. Um, matter of fact, as you look through the Old Testament all the way through Jesus, um, anytime there was sin, uh, I, don't, I don't see God running and turning his back on that. I see him engaging Adam and Eve after they fell from grace in the garden, taking care of them, clothing them, taking them out. I see them taking Cain, who had just killed his brother, um, allowing him to put a mark on him so that others would not kill him. You know, you walk through the entire Old Testament and the times that Israel turned its back, God was continually coming back. 
And then finally, Jesus. <laughs> he was always around sin, and uh, he didn't turn away from it. It's amazing. So this is our God. I'm going to end with a song. I am not singing it. It's called Another in the Fire by Hillsong. And it's, it's uh, a long song, but I'm only clipping out about a minute and a half. But it, it talks about um, another in the fire is referencing Daniel. And then there's another reference that you'll see um, to Moses. But it's very powerful, especially as Friday arrives and we remember, you know, as the world remembers um, the death of Jesus. And um, thank you for letting me share this time. Take care.